So uh, my uh, topic today is uh, the landscape context of the monumental crosses on Ossery's southwestern border. And uh, as I mentioned, this is part of a, a larger topic about this uh, wonderful border landscape. Uh, so to sort of quickly introduce everyone to the topic, uh, Ossery or Ostriga or Ossria, I've heard both uh, in, the, in Irish, is a moderately large kingdom in the south of Ireland that acted as a buffer state between the larger, more powerful kingdoms of Munster and Leinster. Uh, and at the start of the early medieval period, Ossery was in fact a client kingdom of Munster. Uh, and then during the Viking period under the reign of an important king, Kerbal Mac Dunlinga, it sort of switched allegiances and became uh, a client kingdom of, the, of uh, Leinster, which also through that sort of aligned itself more closely with the Enail, who were the, the sort of more powerful kingdom in the north of Ireland. And my study area is particularly the southwest border of Osiraga, uh, where it shares with Munster. Uh, so you can see sort of in the red circles there, sort of where it fits into the, the wider map of Ireland, and then uh, a sort of close up uh, map of specifically the study area is, uh, is a bit color coded, with uh, the green being the sections of the, the study area that belong to Austria itself. And then the blue, uh, red, and purple, each representing different sub kingdoms within uh, its border, uh, within neighboring Monster. And there are four of the Ossery series high crosses on this uh, in this landscape, uh, north to south, these being Palamary, Ahemi, Kilkir, and, and Tabrachni. Uh, so the Ossery series of high crosses uh, are part uh, are a, a series of high cross that runs across mostly the borderlands in and around Ossery. Uh, although there's not a universally agreed upon definition of this grouping, with, uh, for instance, the crosses at Shirkiran, Lorha, and Cashel being sometimes included and sometimes not, depending on uh, individual academics sort of assessment uh, of the uh, of the crosses. Uh, Tabrachni uh, also is sometimes included and sometimes not. Uh, it's in a fragmentary state, and most scholars think it's uh, the fragments of a high cross, uh, but there have been a couple uh, sort of outlier voices that argue that it is, in fact, just a, another stone carved monument that wasn't originally part of a cross. Uh, and most of these crosses are found along the borderlands of Ostriga, with the exceptions of Kilri and Cashel, which are found at the royal heartlands of the kingdom of Ossery and Munster, respectively. Uh, and there's been a lot of attention, mostly from an art historical basis, on the Ossery High Crosses, and particularly their associations with royal power. Uh, so while the crosses themselves tend to bear sort of abstract art, mostly uh, sort of interlace and intense style art, the bases of the high crosses do so figural art. And uh, this one here from uh, the cross base, uh, the Northern Cross at Aheni, uh, is generally thought to be a reflection of the royal power of the Kings of Ossery, and particularly Purple Mac Dunlinga, who I mentioned earlier. Uh, so on this scene here, you have uh, a procession led by a man carrying a cross, with uh, a dead body on a horse being pecked at by birds. And the most common assumption is this is Kerbal returning back from a victorious battle. Uh, the, high, the cross at the start of the procession being a reflection of a relic of a, the true cross, which he was said to bring to battles with him. And then the dead body being pecked at by birds is uh, him sort of unceremoniously bringing back uh, a defeated enemy. Uh, so in this study area, we have four high cross locations. Again, going north to south, you have uh, Kilamery, which is in modern county Kilkenny and historically the Kingdom of Ossery, uh, which bears a single high cross. Uh, Aheni, which is in modern county Tipperary and the only example of the, from the study area that's in the Kingdom of Munster, uh, and is a series of three high crosses. Uh, Kilkiran, which is very close to Aheni, is just on the opposite side on the uh, Kilkenny slash uh, Ossery side of the border is a series of four high crosses. Uh, and then further south is to Brockney, uh, which is, as I mentioned, a fragmentary high cross or possibly an unassociated uh, carved stone. For the purposes of this talk, I will be going under the assumption it is a high cross. Uh, so while these, uh, these, as I mentioned, these have been uh, investigated a lot sort of through an art historical basis and their carvings, there hasn't really been any uh, scholarship really focusing on their landscape interpretations and why they were placed at the specific points in the landscape that they were. Uh, so that's uh, sort of what I've been attempting to do and what I'll be talking about as we move forward. Uh, and I did this through a combination of GIS and field visits, sort of trying to mediate between 
the uh, sort of scientific uh, but very sterile results of GIS into the much more uh, interpretive, uh, but you know, uh, sort of in many ways more tan more tactile experiences of seeing the process in person. Uh, so I did this sort of with three ways. So the first being observer point analysis, uh, which is sort of a landscape approach uh, to uh, to GIS, and then followed it up with a view and viewshed analysis. Again, using the GIS, but much more locally at the crosses, and then the qualitative visual experience of the crosses, uh, which is just me using fancy words to say I went to the crosses and looked around. <laughs> uh, so first, I'll talk about the observer point analysis. Uh, this is a tool used by GIS uh, where random points in the landscape are selected uh, and then the view from those random points compiled together to try and estimate which points in the landscape are more visible and which are less visible. So on the black and white map there, uh, you can see the lightly shaded areas and the white areas are thought to be, uh, according to the GIS, highly visible points in the landscape, whereas uh, the darker shaded or black areas are particularly not visible areas of the landscape. Um, and I've in included that uh, first map, again, just so you can sort of orientate yourself a bit better with sort of the loss of, uh, of detail afforded by, by that analysis. And this actually led to what I thought was an extremely surprising result, which is none of these monuments actually are, are located in particularly visible points of the landscape. They're almost hidden in these strange nooks and crannies, uh, which is, again, something we wouldn't expect both through monuments as a whole, but also through uh, similar monuments, such as uh, the Pillar of Ellisig, which is a, uh, a high cross in Wales, also at an important borderland, but seems to be located at a particularly visible point of the landscape. Uh, so, having reached this strange conclusion, I then moved forward with the GIS and my personal experience of visibility at the individual crosses, uh, and I'll be continuing my trend of moving north to south as I discuss these. Uh, so, our northernmost cross is at Kilamery, uh, which has a very expansive view to and from uh, this uh, wide open plain into uh, the northwest, into the Kingdom of Munster. And particularly, it, run, it looks quite well onto the modern N76 roadway. Uh, and you can see that modern truck going through the distance from my photograph at the high cross there. Uh, and what makes this very interesting is it's quite possible an early historic routeway as well. Uh, definitely, uh, roadways through that, uh, that follow roughly the path of the N76 are located on uh, early modern maps, such as the 1714 map by Herman Mall. Uh, and then one they were constructing this roadway, they, put, they did a, uh, excavations before, uh, before making the roads. And there seems to be evidence of early medieval activity. Although, of course, it's harder to detect whether that activity indicates a roadway. Uh, but there were cereal grinding kilns and field boundary ditches found. Uh, so this seems like a very likely candidate for an early medieval roadway. Although, of course, we can't be certain. Uh, moving south, uh, the crosses at Aheni. Uh, have almost the exact opposite experience and have an incredibly restricted view really just around the crosses. Uh, and even on the, the sort of GIS estimations, where you can see the bright orange sections there representing where it thinks it might be visible. Definitely in the uh, modern landscape, although again, questionable how much this could apply to the early medieval landscape, there's also a nice sort of wall of trees around that really restricts your, your visibility just to uh, this immediate local area of the of the church site. However, uh, it is right next to Carrigadoon Hill, which you can see sort of in the right behind those two high crosses there. And Carrigadoon Hill uh, is the rock of the fort, and there is indeed a prehistoric or likely prehistoric hill fort located at the top of that hill. Uh, and this ties in quite nicely with the church site of Aheni, which is uh, which while in the in modern times is mostly known as Aheni. Uh, early medieval records suggest it was called Ruin Doom or the Hill of the Fort. Uh, so it seems as though even if this, uh, that this uh, sort of the, the church site here was quite well associated with Carrigadoon Hill and the possible and the hill fort upon it, uh, and this really changes the visibility dynamic of this location. So even though Aheni itself, the church site and the high crosses are very invisible in the landscape, again, mostly being tucked away and hidden, uh, if we uh, really, if we go forward with this association with Peregrine Hill, it becomes incredibly visible in the landscape. Uh, this is uh, sort of a nice flat uh, plain around the riverbed that is really dominated by Peregrine Hill and another hill also bearing a prehistoric hill fort right behind it. 
so this uh, photograph here is taken just outside of uh, of the church site at Kilkiran, and you can really see, I think, the way that Kerrigadoon Hill just sort of dominates the visual experience of this landscape. Uh, so even though a Henny uh, church site itself and those crosses are fairly invisible in the landscape, if we imagine an association in the minds of early medieval peoples between that church site and Kerrigadoon Hill, that it becomes an incredibly visible part of the landscape that would be in everyone's mind as they travel through it. And speaking of the road to Kilkiran, uh, Kilkiran is sort of a mediator between the visual experiences of Kil Amory and the Henny, having a bit of a restricted local view into uh, some of the plains around it without being as restricted uh, as it was in, uh, in a Henny. Uh, also, quite interesting, as I mentioned, this is just on the uh, Ossery side of the border, and it looks quite well uh, into not just the, the landscape generally, but specifically towards uh, the sort of boundary line between Ossery and Munster and into Munster itself. Uh, also, this uh, seems to be projecting quite nicely onto another possible early medieval routeway, this one possibly a bit more questionable. Uh, as you can see on the map there, there's a light orange line that runs roughly parallel with the border. Uh, and that was created by GIS, uh, sort of finding the most easy route through the landscape, uh, going through uh, places with placing evidence of, uh, of travel, such as a heading itself, which seems to be a porting point. Uh, and then our final high cross location at Tabraki overlooks the river shore. Uh, unfortunately, today, this view is somewhat obstructed. You can see from the photograph there, there's uh, a nice line of trees blocking you from the most immediate view of the river, and it's just off to the side. Uh, but most likely, in the early medieval period, you would have had a much clearer view. Uh, the landscape, or the part of the landscape there that has the trees in front of it was, uh, during the early medieval period, it's part of the graveyard at the church site of Tabrachne, and therefore most likely would have been kept uh, relatively treeless, affording you a nice view onto the river. Uh, this look onto the river possibly brings in some uh, Hiberno Norse associations, as we know the river shore was being used by uh, used for travel by the Vikings as they went on their excursions into Ireland. Uh, and even more so, there seems to be quite evidence of Hiberno Norse presence at Tabrachne itself. Also, just beyond uh, that tree line, unfortunately, hidden the uh, railway that was constructed in the early modern period. And during that construction, as they dug through the uh, the grave, as they dug through that graveyard, uh, they actually encountered one, possibly two, uh, Viking weapon barriers. Unfortunately, because this was a construction job, not an archaeological investigation, the uh, the sources are a little bit sketchy. But there was a Viking sword and a Viking spearhead found in one of the, in uh, again possibly one of the graves. It's unsure based off of the descriptions they get whether this was one grave that contained both weapons or two different graves with a weapon each. Uh, and this isn't something we should be particularly surprised about, as the Kingdom of Austria during this time uh, was actively pursuing sort of positive diplomatic relationships with the Scandinavian incomers, uh, and particularly under, again, that King Kerbal MacDunling, who appears quite frequently in the genealogies of Viking Iceland, uh, where a lot of the Jarls are said uh, and other prominent pe uh, features, it, prominent people in uh, in Viking Iceland are said to uh, have a wife who was the daughter of Kirvil Irakonder, Kirvil the Irish king. So having gone through the investigation of those crosses, let's move towards what can we learn about the wider landscape associations of the Osiri uh, High Crosses. Uh, I believe the most likely conclusion is that uh, the, the landscape uh, points being chosen for these crosses uh, are being picked to pick uh, to sort of focus on the view from the cross. You know, how somebody who is using the, the cross as a ritual focus, who's performing prayers, uh, and again, other religious rituals at these crosses are going to experience the landscape uh, rather than uh, sort of the visual experience of someone in the landscape towards the crosses. Uh, because partially again because of that uh, earlier analysis that says these crosses aren't particularly visible but i think uh that uh, the view we do have is quite interesting and uh, if we sort of combine this with the artistic focus of royal power again seen on that cross space i would suggest that this is leading to uh sort of purple macdonlinga or his immediate descendants who are erecting these crosses uh, as sort of emphasizing 
the, uh, the claim to these disputed borderlands. Uh, and this is quite interesting, uh, particularly if we bring in a bit more of the written sources from this time. Uh, so according to some medieval texts, such as the expulsion of the Daishi in the late prehistoric period, uh, Ossery had quite a large territory extending into what is now Eastern Munster, possibly as far as the Rock of Cashel itself, the capital of Munster. And it's only during the, the transition period between late prehistory and the early medieval period that uh, that uh, the Munster men really managed to take this uh, territory and subjugate Ossery. Therefore, if this is in fact being used as a way to sort of claim this territory, then it's not just a, a claim of conquest, soil lands as it's called in the uh, Irish sources, but is in fact uh, really trying to re-emphasize that territory as historically Ossarian territory. Uh, and I think this is particularly pertinent with something like uh, a henny, which is again associated with a prehistoric hillport. It could be a way of Kerbal or the other Ossarian kings as a way of saying, this is our territory and it always has been. So I think that, uh, again, in conclusion, that the landscape context of these uh, monumental stone crosses in southwestern Ossery are a way for the kings of Ossery to be able to project the royal power into that landscape. And at that, I think I'll open myself up to questions. It's fascinating. Well done. <laughs> um, yeah, so does anybody want to ask comments and questions? Here we have our two coming up. So you first. Thank you, Colin, for your amazing uh, lecture. Thank you. Uh, primarily uh, interesting. Um, yes, one question is very basic. Uh, yeah, we talk about in the, uh, this process of making the landscape. We understand that this process, of course, uh, there are some special places to know. Uh, in the connection with this monastic uh, life with the Irish monks, you know, and uh, also near rivers and hills and the view from the cross. Perfect. But my question is related basically why in the world line? What, what, what do you think uh, about the, the, the meaning of the, the cross in the borderline, the post line? Could be, for example, the, uh, the understanding approach from uh, the sailors, you talk mm -hmm. about the Vikings, for example, yeah. in the cross line. So, I have an example, for example, of the Dan Lock in the middle town. Uh, when I was there, uh, it was very interesting because you can see the whole, uh, you know, landscape and the hills, and, and there's a river there, you know, beautiful. But when you uh, see a cross uh, in the borderline near the sea uh, and world, looking mm -hmm. from the sea to the cross, that's maybe like a special meaning. What do you think about it? Uh... I think that's a very interesting question. I sort of think, uh, again, it's, uh, so we could interpret it as, as mostly as, uh, again, I think I'm sticking with the, the idea that this, at least to some regards, obviously they have a religious component, which uh, is very important and shouldn't be sort of missed, although the fact I'm not, you know, actually commenting on that at all. But if we stick with the idea of royal power, uh, then sort of the borderlands in particular are uh, an area where Irish kings seem to have lacked a lot of power. Uh, so going in with the Vikings, uh, I think it's worth noting that a lot of Viking settlements happened in the borderlands uh, is sort of where they were able to best establish themselves. Uh, so, for instance, if we continue down the river shore, uh, I think I passed it. Yeah, if we continue down the river shore uh, going through, there's actually a prominent Viking uh, settlement at Woodstown, uh, actually not too far, it's sort of just cut off of the map there. Uh, and even sort of in the pre Viking period, uh, the uh, sort of Fian, the sort of semi-nomadic warriors are again established themselves mostly in the borderlands and are a uh, and were sort of less directly controlled by the kings as, as sort of other warriors uh, at the time might have been. So I think uh, that the borderlands are a particular are a place where a king might have had a particularly loose control. Uh, and so by sort of asserting the control here is, is sort of a bit more necessary than it might be sort of in your own home. Thank you. Thank you. 